lecture series for Introduction to Philosophy. In this video, we're going to begin our examination of the dialogue which completes the set of dialogues um, that describe the trial and death of Socrates. And that dialogue is the Phaedo. Now, I want to say a few po initial points about the Phaedo before we get into the text itself. The first thing is the Phaedo is somewhat different from the other three dialogues we have examined thus far. Right, so if you think about the Euthyro, the Apology, and the Credo, in all those dialogues, although they were written by Plato, Plato was essentially giving you Socrates' point of view, Socrates' philosophy. And although this dialogue, the Phaedo, fits into the same narrative structure with those dialogues, right, so the Euthyro, we see Socrates before his trial, Apology at trial, Credo after his trial, awaiting his sentence in jail, and the Phaedo is going to describe the final conversation that Socrates has with his, his friends and his associates. And then at the very end of the dialogue, there's the famous death scene where he drinks the hemlock, which is the poison that ultimately causes his death. So it fits into the narrative structure. But one very important difference with the Phaedo is that in the Phaedo, what we're largely seeing is actually not Socrates' ideas, but Plato's ideas himself. Although... There's, we might take the implication, and many think that the death scene at the very end of the dialogue is actually supposed to be more or less an account of what really did happen with Socrates' death. A lot of the major arguments are going to appeal to ideas that Socrates didn't really himself hold, but were really more Plato's ideas. So I may still use you know, Plato or Socrates sort of interchangeably, but just keep in the back of your mind that in this dialogue, we're really getting more into Plato's ideals. A second point. So I want you to take a look at the picture we're looking at right now. Uh, it's, it's a famous painting called The Death of Socrates, which is supposed to be a depiction of Socrates right before he drinks the hemlock. So you can see one of his, uh, one of his friends is very um, forlorn and sad, handing him the poison. You can see that everyone there is extremely upset. But you should notice two things about Socrates himself. First, he doesn't seem upset at all. In fact, he seems to be just continuing a philosophical discussion. Secondly, you'll also note that he's pointing upward. And these points, both of these points are very important. The fact that he is, has such a contrast in his attitude with everyone else there. He's not saddened by his death. And also that he's thinking of things not of this world. He's thinking of where his soul is going to be following his death. Because what we see in the Phaedo are a couple of things. Socrates is going to give us some arguments for why he believes the soul is immortal. That is, he's going to believe, give some arguments for why he thinks his soul will not die with his body, but will survive after his death. And the reason this makes him happy, the reason this makes him not sad and uh, distraught as all his friends are, is that he actually thinks his death and the separation of his soul from his body is the only way he can finally complete his philosophical mission. It will be the final culmination of all the work he's done in philosophy in his life in this world. So those are two points to keep in mind. This picture demonstrates some of the major themes of the dialogue. So let's jump into the text. And what we see at the very beginning is that we have a conversation between, uh, between Phaedo and Echocrates. So these two individuals, Phaedo and Echocrates, it's actually taking place after the events of Socrates' death. So when we pick up this dialogue, Socrates has already died. And we learn that Phaedo was there himself, but Echocrates was not. And he essentially wants to know what happened. And of course, Phaedo is very um, excited. He's more than willing to discuss this with, with Echocrates. He says, I have time and I will tell you the whole story, for nothing gives me more pleasure than to call Socrates to mind whether talking about him myself or listening to someone else do so. So we see, we see Phaedo is, of course, a friend of Socrates, very excited to tell Echocrates what happened and recall to his mind um, Socrates once again. Now, there's a bit of setup at the beginning, but I want to jump to one passage in particular, which I think brings out many of the important themes and points that, that we're going to see in this dialogue through Socrates. So, Here's Phaedo explaining to Echocrates what Socrates' overall mood was like prior to his death. And I've already told you that you shouldn't expect Socrates to be sad about his death, but notice the way he specifically explains this. 
So Fido tells us, Socrates sat up on the bed, bent his leg, and rubbed it with his hand. And as he rubbed, he said, what a strange thing that which men call pleasure seems to be. And how astonishing the relation it has with what is thought to be its opposite, namely pain. A man cannot have both at the same time. Yet if he pursues and catches the one, he is almost always bound to catch the other also. Like two creatures with one head. So he says pain and pleasure have this sort of tandem relationship where when we seek pleasure, we eventually find pain. And when we experience pain, we eventually find pleasure. Now, what's notable about this is that, because I think there's a sort of metaphor here, right before this, we are told that when Socrates is having this conversation, he was finally released from his bond, so he was chained up, right? And he says this same experience where, and now he's, he's been released from these chains, and he says this same experience is happening to him. He was experiencing the pain of being chained up, being in bonds, now they've been taking off, and he's experiencing pleasure. So he says, this seems to be happening to me. My bonds cause pain in my leg, and now pleasure seems to be following. Now, what is this pleasure? Well, it just is the pleasure of having his leg released from being in chains. And we can imagine that's a great relief. No one would want to be chained up to a wall all day, and being constrained is a painful experience, especially with the bonds and chains that were holding him back. But there's also another point here. It's a foreshadowing. It's a metaphor for the whole point of the dialogue. Because in a sense, what we're going to see is that Socrates is going to tell us that this life, in essence, is like a prison. The life we have now, right? So he says that we have these immortal souls. And where are these immortal souls right now? Well, they're tied down in some way to our body. And he doesn't think of this as a sort of of a benefit in any sense he thinks of this as a constraint the soul is tied to the body it can't get away the the way he puts it the body is a sort of prison for the soul and so although you know sometimes we think of well the good for us comes through our body for, through the pleasures and enjoyments that the body allows us to have he's going to say well that's not truly what's good for you and in part that's because if what you are is a soul then whatever is good for your body can't truly be good, be good for your soul as well. So it, what you're really doing is dragging this body around. It's a sort of burden, a weight that's bringing your soul down. And so think about now, think about this in terms of death. For Socrates, death is going to be not just the cessation of your bodily functions, but it's going to be the separation of your soul from your body. Death is the moment at which your soul is finally freed from the body and can live an immortal life in some sort of afterlife, whereas if we take the apology seriously, Socrates, Socrates believes he may be able to continue um, philosophical discussions. So this, what he's saying right here about his chains in prison is really a metaphor for what he wants to say in the dialogue. We ought to focus on the soul, we ought to focus on gaining knowledge, we ought to focus on philosophy, we ought to focus on those things which separate ourselves from our bodies. And in fact, it's only in doing this that Socrates believes he can finally fulfill his philosophical mission. Okay, so we see some of the main themes here. We see where he's, he's going. And we can further see this connection between separating the soul from the body and philosophy when he brings up again this sophist, uh, Evanus. Now, you might remember Evanus, um, he was briefly mentioned in the Apology, and Socrates there ironically mentioned him as, as someone who, oh, well, um, you know, if you would give that much money to Evanus to, to improve your sons, he must be a great philosopher. He must truly know how to live a good human life. Now, of course, Evanus is a sophist, so this is to be taken ironically, and the same th thing is happening here, too. So Socrates says, tell this to Evanus, Cebes, and wish him well and bid him farewell, and tell him, if he is wise, to follow me as soon as possible. Now, what does that mean, follow me? Well, that means follow me to death. I am leaving today, it seems, as the Athenians so order it. And Simeus responds, another of the individuals that Socrates is dialoguing with here, who was around him uh, during his death, what kind of advice is this you are giving to Evanus, Socrates? I have met him many times, and from my observation, he is not at all likely to follow it willingly. Willingly, Socrates says, well, wait, is Evanus not a philosopher? I think so, Simeon said. 
then Evanists will be willing, like every man who partakes worthily of philosophy. Now, there are a couple of points here. One is that, again, Socrates being ironic, Evanus is not truly a philosopher, he was a sophist, so of course he would be focused on the goods of the body, like pleasure and power and influence and fame and reputation. So for that reason, of course, Evanus wouldn't be willing to follow Socrates into death because he would think that would be the end of the goodness of his life. It would be the end of those things which he is pursuing. But the deeper point here is that there seems to be some connection between the practice of philosophy and a certain sort of attitude toward death. Again, Socrates says here that every man who partakes worthy of, worthily of philosophy and who is wise would be willing to follow me into death. And so this attitude I'm going to call the philosophical attitude toward death. What we're going to see is that for Socrates, the true philosopher has no reason to fear death. Rather, the true philosopher has every reason to look forward to death. And again, notice how different this is of an attitude toward death than that we commonly see, and we saw this in the Apology as well. The average individual is extremely sort of uh, anxiety-ridden and by death, or death can be anxiety-provoking for them. It's a extremely fearful thing. But Socrates says, no, if you've trained yourself the right way, if you've practiced philosophy the right way, if you are a true philosopher, if you understand what constitutes the good of the soul, if you understand what it means to gain knowledge, then you will be looking forward to death because, it, again, it is the culmination of your philosophical practice. Now, this is an interesting claim because let's say we take that seriously. Let's say we take seriously the idea that we should be looking forward to death, that the true philosopher should embrace death. Now, what practical implications might that have? Because you might say to yourself, well, if a true philosopher should embrace death, then does that mean that the true philosopher should end his or her own life? Ought the true philosopher to commit suicide? Another related way, you might say, well, if we ought to be embracing death, then what is in fact wrong with killing another person? If death isn't a bad thing, then how is it bad to kill another? But we commonly think that killing or murder is among the worst possible crimes. Now, the idea of killing another person, a murder, doesn't come up, but the question of suicide, the question of ending one's own life, does come up. So, it's, the question is posed, yet perhaps he will not, or Socrates says, yet perhaps he will not take his own life, for they say that is not right. Then Batsides asked another of the interlocutors, how do you mean, Socrates, that it's not right to do oneself violence? and yet that the philosopher will be willing to follow one who is dying. So there seems to be a tension here. If the true philosopher should follow those who are dying, if the true philosopher should embrace and accept death and look forward to it as a culmination of their philosophical work, then why would it be wrong, why would it be a bad thing to end one's own life? Yet Socrates suggests it is. Now, before we get to his response, I want to make a little more clear just why this is a problem, why this tension exists between the claim that death is good for us in some sense, but suicide is wrong. Because these concepts will also be helpful as we move through the rest of the dialogue. So to see just how this tension comes about, first I want to consider the following question. I'm going to call it the survival question. So the survival question just is, will I survive the occurrence of some event E? Okay, so just some event that we'll, we'll call it E. So you can ask this about anything. Sometimes we say this in like a, a, a sort of colloquial sense. You, maybe you have a meeting at work. You come up like, oh, I don't know how I'm going to survive this meeting. Um, or, you know, you, you've got a class. You're not looking forward to how will I ever, ever survive this lecture. Now, usually <laughs> that's sort of an ironic or colloquial, colloquial way of speaking. But in general, when we're at, if, if you take that statement seriously... The question is, am I still going to exist after this meeting? Am I still going to exist after this class? And the humor in that comes because we think, well, of course you are. But it's worth being quite precise about just what we mean about survival because that explains why we find those statements humorous. So what we mean by the concept of survival is some person P survives some event E if and only if P continues to exist after E occurs. 
So when you say, oh, how am I going to survive this meeting? Like, you know in your back of your mind you really will. You're using it in a humorous way. But you might also use it in a more serious way. Right? Suppose there was a car crash. And the question is, well, were there any survivors? Well, what you're saying is there were people prior to the car crash who said, at time one, we'll say, who say, I exist. At time two, this event occurs, occurs, the car crash. And if there are survivors, then there are people on the other side who are saying, I still, I still exist. I survived the crash. Okay, so that makes sense. That's a sort of common sense way of thinking. We say uh, car crashes are bad, but we can survive them. There's all sorts of events that we can survive, that we can continue to exist after they've occurred. But now, think about the concept of surviving one's death. And think just how strange that is. Because we talk about this um, you know, somewhat commonly. There's many religious traditions that have an idea that um, you can survive your own death in some sort of afterlife, a heaven or hell or some other sort of conception of an afterlife. Plato himself thought that we could survive our own deaths. He's going to argue in this very dialogue, in, in the Phaedo, that the soul is immortal, that it lasts forever. But what in the world does that even mean? What does it mean to say that you're going to survive your own death? Because, wait a minute, I thought death was the end. I thought the death was the end of us. It, so use the same schema. At T1, there's a person that says, I exist. Then they die at T2. And at T3, then they say, I still exist. I survived my death. Well, how can you survive your death, is death if death is the end? So I bring this up because it should force us to think about a couple of questions. And there's really three main questions here, I think, that we're going to need an answer to from Plato. So if death is the sort of event that we can survive, then one, we might wonder, what, is it, what does it mean to die in the first place? Because death can't simply mean the end of us. Death has to mean something more specific, because if it means the end, we couldn't survive it. So we need to know, what does Plato mean by death? Two, if death is the sort of thing we can survive, then what reason do we have to fear death or value our life? Now, in a certain sense... We've already seen Plato says we don't actually have a reason to fear death, if you are a true philosopher. But that brings up another question. What is the value of life? What is our purpose in this life? If the true philosopher can look in death and say, that's a good thing for me, that will constitute the culmination of my philosophical work. And then finally, if death is the sort of event we can survive, we have the remaining question that I posed earlier. Why would it be wrong to commit suicide or murder another person? In this video, we're going to focus on question three, um, but in the remainder of the Phaedo, those first two questions especially will become very important. Okay. Now, I told you that Socrates suggests that even though death is good for the philosopher, we ought not to commit suicide, and he gives two different reasons. The first reason is in this passage. Indeed, said Socrates, it does seem unreasonable that when put like that, but perhaps there's a reason to it. There's the explanation that is put in the language of the mysteries, that we men are in a kind of prison, and that one must not free oneself or run away. Now, as I told you, Socrates does, in fact, believe something like this. He thinks the body is a sort of prison from which we need to escape, and it's a prison which we escape gradually through the, through the practice of philosophy, and that finally comes to fruition with our death. So, in some sense, the remainder of the dialogue can be seen as filling out or fleshing out this first reason. So I'm not going to say too much more about that. Really, the rest of the dialogue is about this idea that the body is like a prison. But he also gives a second reason. However, CVs, this seems to me well expressed, that the gods are our guardians and that men are one of their possessions. Or do you not think so? So he gives a second reason. He says, well, it would be wrong for us to commit suicide, even though death is a good thing for us, because we do not own ourselves. In fact, we are the property of the gods. And this is the point I want to look at. And in terms of how Socrates is reasoning here, I would explain his reasoning in the following way, with the following three premises in conclusion, which I'm going to call the argument from property ownership. So P1. People are the property of the gods. Now, we've already seen that just in the previous statement that Socrates seems to express this because he says the gods are our guardians and we are their possessions. And this is not at all a, um, a view that's unique to Plato. 
In fact, we can see it expressed later in the famous Catholic philosopher St. Thomas Aquinas in his argument against suicide. So here's Aquinas t speaking in a more um, contemporary monotheistic or, Ju or Judeo-Christian uh, Judeo tradition. And he says, because life is God's gift to man and is subject to his power, who kills and makes to live. Hence, whoever takes his own life sins against God, even as he who kills another slave sins against that slave's master. And as he who usurps to himself judgment of a matter not entrusted to him. So notice what Aquinas is doing here. He's saying that um, he's comparing our relationship to God to the relationship between a master and a slave. And he, in fact, says that human beings are the property of God. Now, this is an idea we're going to come back to later because the very idea that Aquinas is comparing our relationship to God to what we accept now is a fundamentally evil relationship between human beings. Namely, the idea that one human being can own another of slavery is a fundamentally morally corrupt and evil practice. But he's comparing that relationship to our relationship with God and saying that we are like the slaves of God. We are the property of God. So we'll come back to that idea momentarily, whether that's problematic. But first, just notice that this idea that people are the property of the gods or people are the property of God, depending on what tradition you're talking in, this idea is an idea with deep roots that's uh, somewhat commonly held. So that's the first premise. We are the property of the gods. Second premise. It is wrong to destroy another's property unless the owner of that property indicates there is a necessity for that property to be destroyed. And this seems reasonable, right? I mean, if somebody owns a piece of property, you can't just go around destroying it. Now, maybe sometimes you can destroy it, but you might say, well, we need the permission of the owner before we can destroy this thing. It would be wrong, for instance, to have just bulldoze someone's house that you didn't like uh, because you thought it was an ugly blight on the neighborhood without at least, you know, getting the permission of the owner of the house. And Socrates expresses this similar idea. He says, Would you not be angry if one of your possessions killed itself when you had not given any sign that you wished it to die? And perhaps then, put in this way, it is not unreasonable that one should not kill oneself before a god had indicated some necessity to do so, like the necessity now put upon us. Now there's a couple interesting things here, because on the one hand, Socrates is saying, look, we're the property of the gods, and we can't destroy the gods' property without their permission. But on the other hand, he actually indicates that the gods have given their permission, in some sense, for him to die. Because he says now he's under a certain sort of necessity to die. And what is this necessity? It's the necessity of the punishment given to him by the state. And so... To a certain extent, what Socrates is saying here is, in general, no, it is not okay, it is not morally correct for us to end our own lives because we're the property of the gods. But he actually thinks in this case, it is okay for him to end his own life. And what this means is that he conceives of his death sentence as a sort of suicide. Now, why is that? Well, think about the way in which it's going to occur. At the, the government of Athens is going to provide him with the hemlock, the poison, and he will be the one administering it to himself. He'll be the one drinking it. So there's a philosophical question here about whether that constitutes suicide. Is it suicide to take an action that ends one's life if, in fact, that action is one that's forced upon you or commanded by the state? Socrates apparently does consider this to be a suicide because he says this is an exception where I'm allowed to destroy the property of the gods because they've said this is necessary because the state has commanded it. But in general, he's saying, without that sort of specific circumstance, without a sign that this is, um, that the gods have said this is necessary, it would be wrong to take our own lives, the wrong, wrong to commit suicide, because again, we are the property of the gods. Okay, so we have those two premises. People are the property of the gods. It's wrong to destroy another's property unless the owner says it's okay. The third premise, suicide causes the destruction of one's own person. Okay, and this seems pretty reasonable. It seems to be just the definition of suicide, although things are a little more complicated than they might first appear. So we're going to come back to that premise as well. Okay, so here's the basic argument. 
People are property of the gods, can't destroy the gods' property. Suicide causes destruction of the property of the gods. Therefore, it's wrong to commit suicide unless the gods have said it's okay. And Socrates does think in his case they have. So, what do we think about this argument, right? And to help us think about this, I want to take it one premise at a time. And I want to look at each of these premises and see whether there's actually sufficient reason to believe they are true. Now, let's start off with premise one. People are the property of the gods. And for sort of ease and sake of convenience, and because all these points will also apply to a monotheistic context, I'm also just going to talk about the idea that people are are the property of God. So first, the first thing we have to ask to evaluate whether this is true is, why is it that we could say God owns human beings? Why are we the property of God? Well, we might point to two factors. First, inequality. If you think about how God is traditionally conceived, as we have said before, as an omnipotent, omniscient, omnibenevolent being, all-powerful, all-knowing, all-good, then the relationship between human beings is radically unequal, right? We don't have God's knowledge, power, or goodness. So that's one way you might say, well, that's why God's justified in owning us. Secondly, you might say that it's because of creation. It's because God is responsible for the fact that we exist. God has created us in some sense. And so these two things together, because of this radical inequality, and because God has created us, you might think, well, this is what lie underlies this relationship where God owns human beings. Or as Aquinas put it, a relationship in which we are like slaves to the gods. Okay, so let's say that's true. Or what I mean is, let's say it's true that we are unequal to God, and let's say it's true God has created us. Does that actually give justification for the idea that God owns us? So take the inequality point, for instance. In all the vast instances of slavery throughout human history, which, again, are morally evil and corrupt, it seems like it's always been in some sense that the beings in question lie in a relationship of inequality, and specifically a relationship of inequality in power. There's one powerful group that comes in and enslaves human beings who are less powerful. And when that happens, we don't say, oh, well, you know, it was a relationship of inequality, so I guess it's okay. No, now we look back and we say, well, that was horrible. Just because there's a relationship of inequality doesn't mean the more powerful get to own, exploit, and subjugate the less powerful. And again, this is why that, that um, analogy that Aquinas made between the God-human relationship and slavery might even be troubling to us. We might say, well, if God is all good, how could he possibly, how could he possibly enter into a relationship of slavery with human beings if slavery is fundamentally an evil? Okay, so now there might be a way to get around this because you might say, well, look, God isn't just more powerful than us. He's also more knowledgeable and also all good. So whatever sort of slavery that God uh, holds over human beings, it's not a morally evil one. It's a morally uh, benevolent one. God knows what's best for us. In addition, in addition to being powerful, God is also all good. So God wouldn't misuse this power. So we might say, well, yeah, it's... You know, maybe somewhat discomforting at first, but when you understand what how God is different from very powerful human beings, maybe that's not such a big issue. But what about the second point? Do we think that the idea that just because God created us, this would entitle God to have ownership over us? And here we can think of another analogy. Notice that in a sense, parents are responsible for the creation of their children. But, and although parents have very wide ownership, right, well, in a certain sort of way, right, we we sometimes speak in a way that parents own kids, right, we say, oh, you have a kid, oh, is that kid yours? But we don't mean that in a real strong sense. We don't think kids are actually a parent's slaves. If the parent mistreats the child, the child can be taken away. So, and in fact, there's all other sorts of ways in which we Although we speak in this way, we don't really think that parents own their children, even before, for instance, the child is 18, they're able to make decisions for themselves. 
So uh, a commentator, a, a philosopher, Michael Colby, who's thinking about this argument, um, gives the following explanation of why it is that would be very strange to say that parents own their children. So he says, but opponents of slavery have consistently argued that human beings are not the sorts of things that can be owned. Similarly, children were once thought of in many cultures as the property of their parents, yet many of us now think that even though parents have many rights with respect to their children, they don't have property rights. Indeed, if parents did own, own their children, then parents would presumably have the right to treat their children the way they treat other forms of property. To take this claim to its logical conclusion, if children were property, parents could sell them, discard them in the trash, or kill them and eat them. So if, ch if neither children nor slaves are property, what reason is there to suppose that human beings in general are property, even God's property? So there are some problems here. It's not clear that it's really morally legitimate to say that an all-good God would have slavery rights, ownership rights, over human beings. So there are some problems with premise one. But, okay, let's suppose we accept premise one. Let's say, okay, people are the property of the gods. Let's move into premise two. This, this premise essentially says it's wrong to um, destroy another person's property unless the owner indicates there's a necessity for that property to be d destroyed. Now, one immediate problem that strikes me here is that this just doesn't seem to be true in all cases, right? The example I gave earlier, certainly I can't just bulldoze your house without your permission. But let's suppose, on the other hand, that you had a nuclear reactor in your backyard. And let's suppose that this nuclear reactor was um, malfunctioning and threatened the health and well-being of the entire city. Now, wouldn't the government be justified in going in there and destroying or disabling that nuclear reactor, even if you didn't give permission? Wouldn't the good of the whole community outweigh your property rights in that case? So on its face, it's not actually clear that it's always it's only wrong to destroy property if the owner gives it permission. But even beyond that, think about why it's wrong to destroy property. Why would it be wrong for me to bulldoze your house? It's not just that you didn't give permission, but it's also that it would harm you. Right? You're using the house to live, as shelter, um, as a place to gather with family and friends, right? Obviously, this it would be a great harm to you if I literally bulldozed your house. But how in the world can we harm God by harming God's property, which are human beings? So Colby also explains this point. He says, But how would stealing God's property by killing yourself harm God? Many believe that God is immaterial and omnipotent. That means not a material thing and all-powerful. However, if God is immaterial, then it becomes mysterious what need or want is served by his owning us. So needs and wants and desires, these are things of the body. But if God has no body, then how is he harmed by his property, his pro property being destroyed? And similarly, how then would killing us destroy something of value to an immaterial God? Similarly, if God is omnipotent, then God can simply create anew any person who killed herself. Hence... For an omnipotent God, there are no scarce goods. Why does this idea of scarce goods matter? Well, property is only beneficial to us, right? It only harms us to have our property destroyed if that property is scarce, right? So if you have some food in your house and someone steals it, but you li literally have an infinite supply of food uh, right there in your fridge that just keeps regenerating, it would hardly be any sort of harm to you. But for God, there is no limits to um, the amount of human beings that God could create. There is no sense in which God has a body that would give him sort of desires and needs in the same way that human beings do. So if the harm of destroying property is the harm that happens to the owner of that property, it's not clear how God could possibly be harmed um, by having his property destroyed. So here's another very odd point. So, in order to, to make this argument work, we need to have some explanation of why God would care about the destruction of his property. But let's say we accept those two premises. We say people are the property of the gods, and we say it's wrong to destroy another's property unless permission is given. Let's say we accept that. There's a final difficult point, which is going to, and this point will be very important as we continue in the dialogue. P3 says suicide causes the destruction of one's own person. But notice how 
At one point in the dialogue, Socrates defines death. He says, is it death, anything else than the separation of the soul from the body? So here's how he defines death. Death occurs when your immaterial soul separates from your body. So another way to think about it is what we're calling death is really just bodily death. It's really just the point at which your body ceases to function. But your soul continues to live on. And most notably, as we've seen, Plato believes that what makes you who you are is your soul. That's what you allow, allows you, again, to survive your death, to continue existing after your death has occurred. But if your soul continues to exist, exist, if you can continue to exist after your death has occurred, then it doesn't seem that suicide would actually cause the destruction of your own person. If what the gods own is your person, is what makes you who you are, then presumably what they really own is your soul. But if suicide doesn't actually cause the destruction of your person, then you haven't even caused the destruction of the property of the gods in the first place. So all in all, I think this is actually somewhat of a strange argument um, for Socrates to make. I think it's strange because by his own light, we don't actually die when our bodily death occurs, so we haven't destroyed the property of the gods. And for this reason, I think probably for Socrates, really the more compelling reason to not commit suicide is that there is something important and vital that we need to do in this life that makes death the culmination of our experience, that makes death something to look forward to for the true philosopher. Now, what that very important task is in this life is something we'll have to see um, as we continue through the, uh, through the Phaedo. So I will stop there and we'll see what that task is as we continue on. I hope this video was useful and I will see you in the next video.